continue with that today because we wanted to break that up into two parts. In the first part, we talked about how does, uh, it's okay to question, and, but it's wrong to disobey God. And sometimes we have doubt, but we can't let that doubt overcome our faith. And today we're going to continue with that. And uh, when I asked a couple weeks ago, majority of you said to go on to this series because I asked which series, to, which one would you like to go on. And a lot of you chose this, and I'm actually kind of happy that we chose this because uh, I've kind of related to it a lot more recently. Um, and looking back, I'm glad because it became eye-opening to me as well. I started recognizing times in my own life where I've doubted myself, and it made me think of the phrase, uh, I think we all have thought or said, tell me everything's going to be okay. Tell me everything's going to be okay. And the reason why we ask that is we want some, uh, we want some recognition or someone to... Uh, say that to us so that we know we are doing okay, some satisfaction. We, we want to be okay. And there, when we aren't okay, the doubt kind of hits home. Anybody with me there? Anybody? Okay, I see some heads nodding. We ask that question a lot, especially when we are hurting or if something isn't going the way we thought it should, or if we want to hear some satisfaction, like I've said. This is because we, uh, when you doubt, or when you have this doubt in your life, your faith is what's being tested. And I want you to understand that you're not alone. Many people in this room have doubted. Me being one of them, youth leaders, show of hands, how many of you have doubted? Question God, me, yes, all of them. You're not alone. It's not an uncommon thing. In fact, in Scripture, you'll see it time and time again. And that's what we're going to talk about. Is, and this is your first point, if you would. Having faith in a time of doubt. Having faith in a time of doubt. And we're going to go through this Scripture, okay? And then we're going to ask the question, what does this mean? Okay? What can we learn from this Scripture? Because I, I, I think... We hear this sermon a lot, or this story a lot, and if you're in church, you hear it a lot, but if you haven't, it's a great, interesting story. Uh, it's in Genesis uh, 33, that's where we're going to start, but it's actually before 33, it's actually in verse 32 and 31, it kind of starts off this story, um, and we're actually going to talk about Jacob, Jacob and his brother Esau. Now, Jacob... Uh, I'll give you context because I always love to tell you why we're reading this or what happened before this so that you understand why this is being said, right? Anybody go to like, you watch your TV show and it said previously on and then it tells you what it is. I want to tell you what happened so you understand what's happening, okay? So Jacob, he was the one who stole his brother's blessing. Anybody Kind of remember that story? Okay, so Jake, when, uh, back in Bible times, whoever was the firstborn would inherit all the land, all the things that their father would have brought up. Okay, so it would just hand it over to the next generation. So when you're the secondborn or the thirdborn, you're kind of left with nothing. Okay, so Jacob is the secondborn, Esau is the firstborn, and his father's dying, he's losing his vision, he's become sick, and Esau, or uh, Esau goes and leaves, and Jacob kind of sneaks and does his thing, and there's a whole thing that happens, and overall he steals his brother Esau, the oldest, blessing from his father. Esau gets furious, and then it leaves Jacob on the run, and he leaves, and he's gone for many years. Now he's coming home. He's coming back at the, where we're at in the story. Genesis 33. He's coming home. He's coming back. And he's actually, instead of going to see his brother like face to face, he, he's a little nervous. He doesn't know because the last time his brother wanted to kill him. So he, he sends his servants to go, hey, tell my brother I'm here and that we have a gift for him to, to try to mend things, if you will. 
And this is the response. This is what happened. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Then Jacob prayed, O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, who, uh, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servants. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. So he's afraid for his people, right? So he decides to split them up, so hopefully if one of uh, one group, if they die, the other group can escape and there still can be life. See, East, uh, Jacob, he's, he's afraid of what could happen. He's afraid of what's going to, he doesn't know what's going to happen, so he's, he's overthinking and processing everything. He's overthinking and processing everything. He's trying to figure out what is going to happen. Can I ask you guys, I know me, how many times have you, like, had fear of the unknown? Yeah? Like, you, you don't know what's going to happen, but you're afraid this possibly could happen. And then you find out it's, like, not as bad as you overthought. He's having that right now. But here's the cool, crazy part. Um, if you look at verse 8, it's, uh, or verse, sorry, uh, where is it? Uh, verse 9. Then Jacob prayed, O God of Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to my country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. So I want you to understand what this is saying. Back before this chapter, God told him to go back. Okay? God told him to go back, and he's obeying. But even though he's obeying, he's still fearful. Can I tell you this? When you're stepping out in faith, you're trusting God, you're listening to God, it's going to make you uncomfortable. There's going to be things that you don't understand. It's going to make you nervous. But you need to learn to trust him fully and trust his will and trust his plan. Because even though you're afraid, that shouldn't, uh, that doubt should not overcome the faith you have in God. So he is trusting God, even though he is doing his self a favor and like splitting the group. He's not fully invested, but he's there. He's like, I'm trusting you, God, I'm doing this, just so you're aware. Okay? We go to uh, verse 26, but before that, he then sends his family off uh, across the river so that they would not be harmed during anything. He sends them away. Um, and at this time, he, he decides to pray and be alone. And this is where he starts to physically, physically wrestle with God. God comes before him, and he's physically wrestling him. And this is what it says in verse 26. Then the man said, let me go, for it is David. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? He said, Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Now, here's, I think, very unique. This is Sam's thoughts. I think the reason why God asked him who he was not because he didn't know, but because of what he's done in the past of denying and pretending to be someone else. How he had to pretend to be Esau. 
how you had to pretend to do this. And God wants to make sure that he is fully invested, fully trusting in him, and to continue. See, there's going to be times where you are tested in your faith. That's not a bad thing. It shouldn't be a thing to discourage you. It should be a way to motivate you to be better. In the next, uh, and also, I want this to be noted. It says in verse 26, the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. He sent his family out during the middle of the night. So they were wrestling the entire time. Sometimes it's going to take a while. And I want you to understand that because it's going to help us with a point later on. In the next chapter, uh, Jacob's brother comes and embraces him. They finally meet, and instead of fighting with Esau, instead of Jacob dying by Esau, Esau decides to forgive and embrace his brother. See, sometimes when we go through life, the things that we overthink about doesn't always go to the way they planned. And there are actually, if you listen to God the first time and trust in Him, it's all used for His glory. And it all ends well. Now, what can we learn from this story? Yes, we broke up pieces, but that's the next point. What can we learn from this story? And there's two things that we can learn from it. Okay, two things we can learn. The first thing is this. There are going to be times you need to stand up. There are going to be times you need to stand up. So that's your first point, if you would, stand up. Okay? This means you need to fight for what you believe in. Be in your word. Pray. You are going to need to fight. How do you fight as a Christian? You be in your word. You pray. You fast. You worship, you do all those things because it's the way how we fight our battles. Anybody heard the song? Like, how, Abby, what's the song? This is how I fight my battles. Is that the name of the song? Surrounded. Surrounded. This is how I fight my battles. By worshiping Him. By surrendering to Him. Not just, and this does not mean just random, randomly spurts of prayer either. I'm sick and tired of the Christian life Notice I say this, Christian life of just going to church and praying when you're uh, eating, before you eat, and you read your Bible once a once in a week. I'm proud of you for praying. I'm proud of you for reading your Bible. But can I be honest? I've done that, and it does nothing. Being a Christian means more than just going to church. Being a Christian means more than just praying over your food. It's actually going out and helping people, being loving, showing compassion to people. Yes, you're on Sunday, but can I be honest? Half of us don't even like standing for the, singing a five-minute song. The reason why we stand is to say, God, I'm being vulnerable. I'm not going to be comfortable lounging in my chair. I'm going to stand up and worship you. I'm going to kneel down. Because this is the most vulnerable position someone can be in. Is this. And saying, God, I surrender to you. These are things that we need to do constantly. It's not just a thing that some weird people do. No, it's a thing we need to do. just me coming at you. No, this is me coming at myself. I haven't read my devotion in two days and I'm upset with it. We need to be better. We need to read our Bible. We need to pray. And not just, again, not just, Lord God bless this food, bless it to my body. Jesus name pray. Amen. Oh, it's Chick-fil-A. It's pre-blessed.
Tell me who that is. I went to Riverside this past Tuesday. Holy cow, that is a big school. How many kids do you pass by every day? How many of them know that you're a Christian? Some of you go to a Christian school, but you don't even pray for the person next to you. Guess what? Christians need prayer too. We need to stand up. Mark 11, 24 says this, Therefore I tell you, whenever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Be bold in your faith. Be willing to go. Don't be shy about it. This world needs real Christians more than anything. I'm sick and tired of seeing the influence, influencer Christians make everybody afraid. I'm sick and tired of people saying they're Christian and then they don't act like it. I'm mad. Because not only are they giving Christian... The, Christian, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. It's something that we need to do every single day. That we grow with God and build our relationship with God. It's not something we put on our Instagram bio. I'm hurt every time I go on social media because a lot of people don't represent it right. And that's not me calling them out, no, it's not my job to. If I could, I would, trust me. But it is my job to live one, to live out being a Christian, to be like Jesus. Now, we need to be bold. But there's something on the same coin that's on the other side. It's on the flip side, if you would. We need to take a step back and slow down. See, that there are going to be times you need to stand up and fight and go all in. Go all in for God every day. But on the other side, you need to take a step back and slow down on your everyday life. Slow down. Breathe. Whoa. Slow down. In fact, I, I want all of us to do this. Breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth. Ready? One more time. That not only calms the anxiety down, but calming the anxiety down and breathing allows you to think more clearly. I've said this before, part of the fruit of the Spirit is what? Self-control. But also, it's peace and patience. Have peace in mind. Be patient, even when you are worried, even when you're afraid, even when you want the answer right now, be patient. Because sometimes you're not ready for the answer that God wants you to have. And he's trying to teach you a valuable lesson. Um, it, it, it's take time to rest in the presence of God. In fact, Psalms 46 9 through 11. I chose 9 through 11 because 10 is a verse that we use all the time, but I want you to understand what is being said. Psalms 46, 9 through 11, it says this, He makes war, uh, he makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and exalted among the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob, the man we talked about earlier, is our fortress. 
The man who was very stressed, anxious, thought he was going to die by his own brother, but trusted in God and had faith in him, even though there were times where he even questioned what was going on, he still trusted him, and look what happened. God provided. We need to be calm and be still. Learn to let go. See, the, the, the phrase be still is actually, I looked this up, be still is actually a way of surrendering. It's not saying be still and like, you know, like you're a robot and you're just still. No, it's saying surrender everything to him because he's the Lord of all. He's going to be, at the end of the day, he is going to be the one we exalt. He's going to be the king when we go into heaven. He's the one we're worshiping. Not anything here. Everything here is going to fade. We, yet we spend so much time worrying about the things that don't matter instead of focusing on the one that does. I'm going to conclude with this. We're going to go into small groups. And there's two questions that I want you to write down. Or two questions that I want you to write the answer to. And you can write it on your notes. You can write it on your phone. But I always want you to remember this. Because I want you to look back at it. And see if you've actually grown from these things. Okay? The first question is, what do you need to let go? What do you need to let go of? That's the first question. This, this means uh, when you're slowing down, what is controlling you? What do you need to surrender or what do you need to remove for God to take over? So what do you need to let go of? That's the first question. The second question is this. What do you need to add? What do you need to add? This means what do you need to do to get stronger in your faith? What are things to help you step up and be bold in God? What are things that you can do now? And I want you to apply these. And I don't want you to say, I'm going to do this every day for the month. No. Take it day by day. You're not promised the end of the month. None of us are. We don't know when God's coming back. Take it one step at a time. Go day by day. Day by day, saying, God, I trust in you, helping to live for you. I can't worry about tomorrow because I don't know what tomorrow will bring. But I can trust in you and today. We're going to pray, and then I'm going to have you go into your small groups.